there's this collective consciousness happening around focusing on meat, a food that's been demonized, vilified, mm -hmm. and it looks to be incredibly healthy and nutritious for humans. I believe almost all physicians are intelligent and well-intentioned. We're just fucking brainwashed. 10.2 really times harder to unbrainwash someone. High fructose corn syrup sneaking in as natural fruit flavor when there's actually no fruit in some of these yogurts. Do you really want to be eating this oil? Do you really want to be eating excess amounts of linoleic acid from any seed oil, but canola specifically? And you really got to read the label. It's like partially hydrogenated. They don't have to put it if it's less than a certain percentage. A lot of what you espouse, what I espouse, it's not fear mongering. It's actually clearing the air. Knowledge is power. Right. But a year and a half into it, run into problems with long-term ketosis that we can talk about. Wow. So this is kind of how your diet philosophy has evolved from being pure strict carnivore to now incorporating. <laughs>
And my first foray into diet was a misstep in the vegan world. Okay. So I was a raw vegan for seven months, lost a lot of weight, had horrible GI symptoms. I really mm -hmm. couldn't be in a closed room like this with people. My gas was so bad. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. You were just letting them rip, huh? It was so bad. I used, to, I used to work in a small office, maybe half the size of this with two other women, a nurse practitioner and a PA. And mm. after I left that practice, they told this, I mean, I heard stories about how they used to complain <laughs> to the CEO of the business about how bad it was. And they was like, oh, it's so bad. And I was just, I thought I was doing the right thing. And I, yeah. know, months and months and months. I'm detoxing, I'm detoxing. My yeah. gut flora just wasn't having it. Mm. And eventually I kind of realized humans have always eaten meat in our history. We've never, there's never been a tribe discovered of humans that doesn't eat meat. Mm -hmm. It's part of our biology. It's written into our DNA. And I reincorporated meat and did something kind of like paleo for 10 or 12 years, but it didn't fix my eczema and asthma. That, mm. that vegan diet didn't fix it. So I haven't eaten a lot of processed You felt better. Foods. You put some muscle back on. You, yeah, yeah. But yeah, muscle back on. I was running at the time <clears throat> faster, gained probably about five to 15 pounds of muscle over time mm -hmm. and started to feel better, but didn't, didn't quite fix the eczema and asthma. And then mm. I was in medical school, had really bad eczema at different times. I was doing a lot of jujitsu and I would get impetigo, which is a superficial... Um, fungal infection, right? Well, or it's a yeast. bacterial infection oh, bacterial. on the skin, yeah, from the mats. When my because you get eczema on my knees and elbows, and they, they get infected, and it was a pain in the ass. Mm -hmm. and I was always tweaking my diet, trying to figure it out. But I thought, you know, I'm eating this organic paleo diet: vegetables, salads, nuts, meat, eggs, fruit, and mm -hmm. and my eczema is still problematic for me. So what's going on here? And it wasn't until my residency at the University of Washington, I had a really, really bad eczema flare. Mm. I did a bunch of uh, sort of mushroom extracts, mm. cordyceps, reishi, chaga, and it just flared my eczema like crazy. I had head to toe eczema. Wow. And I was just sick of it. I was like, this is not right. My <clears throat> immune system is, is not happy with these foods. And I was right about the same time that I was driving to the beach to surf. Um, it was probably a cold, rainy weekend in Seattle. It was miserable surfing there. Yeah. And I heard Jordan Peterson on Rogan's podcast talking about how a strictly meat-based diet improved his autoimmune conditions. Wow. I know he talks about that. I thought he got that from you. You actually No, got I got that it from, from him. him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because he only eats meat, salt, water. Occasionally right? he eats liver. Okay. But it's rare. Yeah. Okay. But that's what I mean, meat, meat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's pretty interesting. And so I am fascinated by autoimmune conditions because the further I went in medicine, so I did two years master's. Uh, as physician assistant, worked in cardiology for four years, four years of medical school, four years of residency. And throughout all that, I was really interested in what was causing human illness. And I started mm. to see this commonality along autoimmune conditions. The immune system is disordered in almost every single chronic disease. Atherosclerosis is autoimmune in some ways. Dementia has autoimmune components. Uh, mental health issues, depression, anxiety, have neuroinflammation mm -hmm. and changes in the phenotype of the macrophage in the brain. Mm. So the immune system is at the center. And I really think that there's a very compelling hypothesis around the gut as this ground zero. Oh, no question. Where the immune system is being programmed, right? Because so much of our immune system lies in the lamina propria, these, these lymphatic tissues right around the gut. Mm -hmm. And so the foods we eat program us in interesting ways. And, and, that can extend to the whole body because these immune cells then move from the gut to the whole body and affect us in different ways. So some people get eczema, some people get autoimmune thyroid disease, some people get rheumatoid arthritis, and often the cause is the same. Mm. But Western medicine doesn't think that way. Western medicine wants to divide illnesses into 10,000 different pigeonholes. 36,000 to okay, be exact. Okay, there you go. Yeah. It's expanding. <laughs> there it's are 36,000 of them. It's become yeah. even more. And I think that it's probably four or five things, right? 36,000 right. from five. It's just different manifestations in different people based on our genetics at a baseline. Wow. And so I thought, okay, if Jordan Peterson is an N of one, but I think these stories of humans are so valuable. What little nuggets, that's a gem. Mm -hmm. That's a diamond piece of information. He fixed his conditions that Western medicine had been telling him and his daughter, Michaela, were incurable mm -hmm. for decades by eliminating all plants. That's crazy. What's going on there? Let me experiment with that. Mm. So I cut out all plants, ate meat, organs, salt, and animal fat for a year and a half. Eczema gets better, right? Never get a recurrence, but a year and a half into it, run into problems with long-term ketosis that we can talk about. Right. Wow. So this is kind of how your your diet philosophy has evolved from being pure strict carnivore to now incorporating clean carbohydrates, berries, honey, fruit, maple. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Things like that. Because no. what happened after a year and a half was that I had electrolyte problems. I had muscle cramps. I had sleep disturbances, heart palpitations, declining mm. sex hormones. Testosterone goes from a total of like 800 to 500. Wow. Sleep disturbance. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then I came across this paper 
that nobody had ever showed me in medical school talking about how insulin affects the kidney and actually signals to the kidney to hold on to electrolytes. And so if we don't get an insulin signal from our meals, we waste sodium and along with the sodium, everything else flows out. That's the way the kidneys work. Mm. There's all these transporters, antiporters, and symporters. Part of the keto flu. Well, part of the keto flu, it's like long-term keto flu. Right. Right? Because my body just wasn't holding on to these nutrients, these minerals. And so I have this kind of crisis of faith. I wrote a book about the carnivore diet because I'm so interested in this collection of people healing things that Western medicine says are not healable. Mm -hmm. Right? There's this collective consciousness happening around focusing on meat, a food that's been demonized, vilified, mm -hmm. and it looks to be incredibly healthy and nutritious for humans, evolutionarily consistent. People healing every autoimmune condition under the sun, right, by cutting plants out. And wow. everyone's a little different, but what's going on here? This is a movement. It's really just a, it's something that's happening even now today. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book about it, and then I'm thinking, oh man, I don't know if I can be strict carnivore. That's hard yeah. on your brain, right? Yeah. It really challenges my mental flexibility to think, okay, maybe there's a piece of the truth here, but maybe I don't have the whole truth. And that's the humility that I've had yeah. the whole time that and I've I been in Western medicine. And I love that. I, I, I love seeing that you're, you're, you're willing to get out of a dogmatic commitment to one you know, linear line of thinking and say, I'm, I'm willing to actually change and evolve and amend you know, my, my protocol and my, my, my dietary recommendations. I always want to be evolving and thinking yeah. and learning. And I, 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 there's the, I think it's just... I forget who said this, but you know, it's like, don't say that you have the truth, say that you have a piece of the truth. Mm -hmm. Who has the whole truth? No one, right? No one. But we all share pieces of the truth in hopes that it will help people that can benefit from our experiences. So I added back fruit, looking at kind of the plant kingdom and thinking the leaves of plants and the stems of plants like celery or the roots of plants or the seeds of plants, which are actually seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, they all have defense chemicals. And this is botany 101. Right. And they all have more defense chemicals than the fruit. And if you look at the fruit, it's colorful, it's sweet. The plant wants you to eat the fruit. Yeah. There's a clear signal it's here. Like, here's a treat, don't eat me. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, yeah, like, here's a treat, don't eat the rest of me, right? right? And, and maybe eat this mango and deposit the seed somewhere else or eat this raspberry and poop out some of my seeds somewhere in a pile of poop fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It's a clear design. And if you look at the way fruit even ripens, mm -hmm. fruit contains defense chemicals and they decline as the fruit ripens. Wow. So an unripe fruit has more defense chemicals than a ripe fruit. There's a clear, there's a clear collaboration between animals, insects, humans, mm -hmm. and plants that's been going on. And we sort of, in some ways, for some people, not everyone, we have these genetic susceptibilities that make us more sensitive to defense chemicals in the vegetables. And what I've come to now sort of over time in my evolution is this perspective that if you're thriving, why change anything? Right. But if you're not, it's really interesting and insightful to question our assumptions about nutrition. First assumption, meat is horrible for us. Every news outlet is going to tell you that. Yep. Saturated That's, fat. So. Yeah. Horrible for you. That's the devil. That's the cause of heart disease. Mm -hmm. Right. Second assumption, vegetables are great for everyone. Plants are the best thing on the earth. Eat more of these to thrive. If you have an illness, it's because you're not eating enough fiber. Yes. It's you're oh not, my God. It's so true. <laughs> it's because you're not so eating true. enough plants, Gary. Right. Yeah. You should eat more plants and less meat. And so I turn that on its head and go, okay, what if I look back at, I, I, in my mind, this is just my sort of my sort of summation of what I look at the medical literature and anthropology. I went to visit the Hadza in Tanzania. You look at where other hunter-gatherer tribes go in terms of their preference of foods. And at this point, we've completely excluded all ultra-processed food. We can talk about that. But if you look right. at unprocessed animal and plant foods, which I think can form an incredibly healthy diet for every mm -hmm. human, there is, I believe, a hierarchy of value in those foods. Mm. And we see this reflected in the way hunter-gatherers behave, the foods they prefer. Mm. And if you ask Western medicine or you ask people who consume general scientific information or nutritional you know, information, plants are at the top. Right. And I'm going to say, actually, let's put plants at the bottom, the vegetables, mm. and put meat at the top, mm. right? Because meat and organs are the center of every human diet that we've ever studied. And it doesn't mean that they eat only meat and organs right. or that they eat the majority of their diet is meat and organs. But if you ask the Hadza, what's your favorite food? It's meat. Right. Without a question. I mean, Singapore has one of the longest average life expectancies and they have one of the highest consumptions of meat in the world. I think it's like a pound and a half average of meat per day. Yeah. And that never gets mentioned in conversations about blue zones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, 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 <laughs> Con conveniently, yeah, we leave that. Conveniently yeah, we leave left out. out of blue zone conversations. Yeah. I don't think Dan Vutner uh, mm. ever visited Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is just recapitulation. This happens over and over in medical science. Yeah, we, we, we could go on to you know, some of the research that I, I, I viewed in centenarians, um, but that's contrary to, to a lot of uh, conventional thinking. I mean, 
mean, we, 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 and in 22 years of mortality research, I did not see a single centenarian, not once. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but we did not process a death claim for a centenarian that did not have clinically elevated levels of LDL cholesterol when they died. Uh-huh. Um, now, clinically I'm, elevated. We should talk about this. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But in any case, I mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, but I, I think there's a lot of conventional wisdom and we form an industry around it. And then, you know, it's like an aircraft carrier moving at full speed to, to, to actually turn it around. It takes, there's so much inertia that to, to actually turn it around because there's so many people on the deck of that ship that are relying on that conventional theory of thinking. And it, it picks up so much momentum and, and you know the healthcare system evolves around it to then actually turn that is is is, is difficult it's super hard it takes but we should i want to come back to that idea that yeah. because there are multiple studies yeah, cuz i want to talk about LDL cholesterol there are multiple yeah. studies that show that people who live a long time light 85 plus the lothian birth cohort have elevated levels of cholesterol so it's quite interesting and yeah. challenges this hypothesis that apob is directly injurious to the endothelium but <clears throat> if we go back to this hierarchy it's like you look at hunter gatherers Meat, organs, honey, mm -hmm. fruit. These are the foods that they prefer. Mm -hmm. You ask the Hadza, what are your favorite foods? Meat, berries, baobab, honey. Tubers is the last thing. Mm -hmm. Vegetables aren't even on the list other than tubers. They don't right. really eat salads, mm -hmm. right? They don't eat seeds unless they're starving. And so that's interesting to me. And again, I want to reiterate the fact that it's not that everyone needs to think about this and limit those foods, but for people who have issues that are unresolved, mm -hmm fatigue, anxiety, mental health issues, sleep disturbance, low libido, weight loss issues, autoimmune conditions of a variety of, of forms, for a lot of those people, limiting or cutting out the vegetable plant foods for some amount of time as an experiment is incredibly helpful. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I didn't want to be carnivore MD anymore, right? Because right. I eat plant foods and I have become less dogmatic over time, hopefully, and I didn't want to say to people, hey, you can only eat this one way. Right. I meet a lot of people who eat vegetables and are super healthy. Right. But I've also met a lot of people, and I think the value of anecdote and story and human experience is, is something you can't ignore, mm -hmm. who cut those things out and have these longstanding issues resolved. So what's right. going on there? Right. It's not something to ignore. And I think that our detractors who are similar and make similar arguments for both of us would say, <laughs> there's no RCT, Paul, that says vegetables are bad for Randomized humans. Randomized clinical trial, yeah. And I'm saying, I can give you a thousand people who have had improvements in joint pain, long-standing inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, insomnia, mental health conditions, mm -hmm. eczema, psoriasis, I'm one of them. You're telling me that's not valid because yeah. there's no RCT? And yeah. I'm not saying everyone needs to do it. I'm just saying, consider this. Yeah, Consider this and understand that meat is being vilified. Organs are not even eaten in the Western consciousness. Mm -hmm. You know, Unique nutrients that are left out of our diets. And fruit and honey, I mean, a lot of, those are, increasingly under attack yeah you know people are saying oh it's going to spike your glucose but we can talk about that too but vegetables are elevated and meat is it's just upside down world which yep. is which is similar because a lot of things depending on your way you see the world the upside down world seems to be a pretty accurate characterization you, of a you, lot of things today. you know it's interesting i had a um a harvard uh, md on on my podcast last week dr palmer and uh he's a uh, harvard md he's a psychiatrist and he's treating some of the most drug resistant mental illnesses and i'm talking about r real crippling mental illnesses um like severe forms of schizophrenia with paranoias and um you know where people are literally trapped inside their own bodies you mm -hmm. know um voices paranoias uh, you know all, all kinds of really tragic consequences that and they're drug resistant and he's treating them with ketogenic diets mm -hmm. and um when you're when you're to the level where you're treating drug resistant mental illness with nutrition, I think you're starting now to see the power that the human body has, not just to heal itself, but that nutrition can have on a whole consequence, a whole cascade of, of, of issues. It's incredible. Um, yeah, it's really interesting what's happening there. I've, I've spent a lot of time working with people who had severe mental illness also. I did my residency in psychiatry. Right. I've since left psychiatry. Yeah. And <laughs> hey guys, if you've been watching the Ultimate Human Podcast for any length of time, you know that one thing I do not do is push products. I do not just let any advertiser into this space because I believe that the products that appear on the Ultimate Human Podcast should be things that I use every day in my life to improve my own physiology. One of them is something called the Echo Go Plus. The Echo Go Plus is a hydrogen 
kitchen water generator that you can take on the go. You essentially take the top off of this bottle, you pour bottled water in this, and repeatedly it will make high part per million hydrogen water. You press this little button, you'll see these bubbles going up in the water, that's hydrogen being created in the water. There are all kinds of peer-reviewed published clinical studies on the benefits of hydrogen water, including reduced inflammation, better absorption of your supplements, better absorption of your foods, better balance of the stomach acid, and it feeds an entire class of bacteria in your gut. Hydrogen water, in my opinion, is the most beneficial water that you can drink, and now you can take it wherever you go. You can go to echo, E-C-H-O, h2o.com that's echo echo h2o.com enter the code ultimate 10 for a discount echo h2o enter the code ultimate 10 for a discount i think that mainstream psychiatry is just a um man just a what a dumpster fire yeah in, in, i mean in the, most res- fire. <laughs> in the most respectful way um but uh you know, I, and that's not because I have anything against the doctors. It's just, it's mostly every doctor I've met has been intelligent and well-intentioned. It's just the medical system is broken in yeah. our paradigm. And I think the biggest break is we treat mm-hmm. from the neck up and from the neck down, right? And we somehow think that this There's, is not connected to this. And that was really uh, my realization that, yeah. you know, I was seeing people in psychiatry and there was never any attention to diet mm-hmm. in my residency at the University of Washington. And yet you're seeing neuroinflammation. That's, mm-hmm. that's the root cause of most psychiatric illness is mm-hmm. neuroinflammation. Like I said, we have these macrophages in our brain. Uh, they're called microglial cells and they, they become inflamed. They have a switch and they become, you know, a certain phenotype when they become inflamed and when they become reactive against our bodies. And what's triggering that? Well, it's something coming from here. And right. so dietary changes in psychiatry, that's such a radical thing to do. And I wish there was absolutely no ability to do that in my residency at the mm-hmm. University of Washington, one of the most preeminent, you know, universities in the country in Seattle, there's no ability to treat anything with diet. It's all medications. Don't worry about the side effects, any of this stuff. And so that was really why I left medicine. I've had this just complete loss of religion and I'm still a doctor. I'm still a board certified licensed physician, but I don't practice. I do this sort of thing mm-hmm. educationally. And I realized that there's so many parallels between the way that we divide <clears throat> the brain and the body And with every other autoimmune condition that we see, I Mm -hmm. mean, I've talked to so many people who go to see gastroenterologists for inflammatory bowel diseases, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis who are told there's no connection with diet. Yes. It's literally in your gut. We see discharge papers from from oncology treatment centers that say dietary recommendations, none. Yeah. And I'm like, none? Somebody just finished, you know, several rounds of chemotherapy for for breast cancer or colon cancer or metastatic cancer and they were blessed enough to be on the other side of this and now there's no dietary recommendations that's incredible even during treatment dietary recommendations during treatment none um that's astounding to me you know ben and jerry's i mean it's how, <laughs> you gotta gain weight yeah yeah you gotta gain weight that's it you gotta gain weight yeah um I want to talk about the keto thing for a minute because yeah. there's a little bit of a discordance here that's interesting to me because I had a bad experience with keto mm-hmm. and Chris Palmer is using keto to treat, mm-hmm. you know, profound mental illness. So I think there's clearly value to ketogenic diet. It's diets. not prolonged keto dieting either. It's it's what I guess he would call a keto reset. Right. right. There's I think there's something to that. And um, we know that when you're intentional about your food choices, things get better. Mm-hmm. And so what he's doing with patients is sort of an incredibly brilliant idea where I'm going to use a keto diet to improve the quality of their diet. I think some sort of a framework for diet helps people do Mm -hmm. that. And if it's cutting out carbohydrates, great, because you're cutting out carbohydrates that are ultra processed. Right. And we know that when you have an ultra processed flour from ultra processed grains, you're stripping out the information that's been there for all of our evolution as humans. And that's very confusing for humans. Right. And I think that the same thing about sugar, and this is a very interesting position that I don't think I've done a good enough job communicating to people. But if you look at processed sugar, if you look at table sugar, Mm -hmm. that is a molecule of sucrose. It's Mm -hmm. a disaccharide of glucose and fructose, right? Mm -hmm. And that is interesting because humans would never have had that evolutionarily. We would have always had that molecule in concert with thousands, literally thousands of other compounds in the fruit. Mm. So you look at honey, there's over 600 components in honey. There's probably over 1,000 components in honey, but 300 haven't even been identified. Mm. So there's polyphenols and, and prebiotics. And you look at a, a piece of fruit, it's probably over 5,000 components in that piece of fruit. Mm. So there's all, this, there's all this contributory information that comes with sugar in our diets, whether it's honey, maple syrup, or a piece of fruit that is not the same as a table sugar, which has zero information. And it goes in your body and it basically just can feed the bacteria in your gut and cause overgrowth and lead to, uh, lead to increases in lipopolysaccharide and toxin, which, which we are so clearly connecting in Western medicine. If you have 
endotoxemia, this increase in lipopolysaccharide in your, in your gut and in your body, mm -hmm. that's horrible for humans. But what's so cool is that if you eat an orange, you're getting fructose in the sugar and fructose gets demonized, but you're also getting all this information that's actually preventing your bacteria in your gut from overgrowing. Mm. So this is a difference. I don't want people to fear fruit or fear unprocessed forms of honey, mm -hmm. but understand that we can't conflate research on processed sugar or high fructose corn syrup. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I want to delineate the difference between fructose that's found in fruit and high fructose corn syrup, which yeah. by the way now is is sneaking into labels. I did, I, I did a podcast short on this as natural flavors, natural fruit flavors, what the and, heck? And, and you really gotta read the label. It's like partially hydrogenated. You know, they, they don't have to put it if it's less than a certain percentage right. um, in there. And so these uh, partially hydrogenated oils, which is, a, you know, the, the slang term for the seed oils and, and um, high fructose corn syrup sneaking in as natural fruit flavor when there's actually no fruit in some, like some of these um, yogurts, you know, with fruit on the bottom. Um, right. It's, it's blueberry flavoring and high fructose <laughs> corn syrup with a dye to look like a blueberry color, but there's actually no fruit in it. It's um, crazy. But high fructose corn syrup is made from corn, mm -hmm. obviously, but corn is all glucose. And it's a different molecule than fructose. Mm -hmm. So in order to make fructose from glucose, you have to extract it, you have to isomerize it, and mm -hmm. then you have to highly process it. So you remove it from corn. It's not even a whole food anymore. It's not even a food anymore. It's just an industrial chemical. Mm -hmm. And there's studies showing that high fructose corn syrup contains trace amounts of mercury and other toxins. And the high fructose corn syrup industry has gone to great lengths to cover these up. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's just, I think this is the problem with humans. And it goes back to this, these simple principles that I think humans can live by and if these guide the way we're living, mm -hmm. we can be so much healthier, which is why would you eat a food that has been stripped of all the information that has always been presented with that in humans? Yes. You know, a, a processed wheat you flour. You would never encounter high fructose corn syrup in nature. Yeah. You would never encounter pure fructose. Mm -hmm. You would never encounter pure sucrose in nature. Right. And yet the studies that vilify sugar are done with those and then conflated. And you see people... I mean, you know, this is just respectful, but I'll call it out. You know, um, on Huberman's podcast, uh, there was a physician recently, Dr. Robert Lustig, just talking horribly about fructose, but conflating research done with isolated fructose mm. or done with isolated sucrose in animal studies or in human studies, again, with isolated molecules and really not giving a different yep. perspective. I don't want people to make fruit or fruit juice their whole diet, but I don't think we need to fear it. And there's an interesting story here, which is, oh, the problem is not the fruit. The problem is not the fruit juice. It's taking away all the information that's associated with it in nature. And the same is probably true of seed oils, yeah. right? Because what is a seed oil? It's an industrial byproduct of a sunflower seed. Right. Or a rape seed or a soybean. Mm -hmm. Foods that humans have probably eaten in small amounts historically, but when you take all the information out of it mm -hmm. and you distill it and you make concentrations of things that humans would have never experienced, we end up with massive problems this year. Especially thing. when you degum it with hexane, you deodorize it with sodium hydroxide. Yeah, you imagine heat it that. Four hundred and five <laughs> degrees and turn it rancid. Yeah, yeah. You know, I That's mean, a problem I, too. I, 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 we talked about this on our last podcast, but I, I, you know, I got censored by the Seed Oil Society of Canada, which I didn't even know, or Canola Oil Society of Canada, and um, and I now was like, well, look, I didn't say canola plants were bad. I said that industrial processed canola oil is bad, right? And, and, and you know, anytime you're adding hexane and sodium hydroxide and high amounts of heat to turn something rancid. Well, canola plants are bad. There's no such thing as a canola plant. It's a rapeseed plant. Yeah, rapeseed. <laughs> and um, apparently you can't even say rapeseed on YouTube. I don't know. <laughs> rapeseed. <laughs> it's, it's one word, guys. Did I, did I just lose my YouTube channel? <laughs> but what's interesting is that you can By the way, why can't you say rapeseed on, uh, not, not to divert. Because it, but... it has the word rape. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you say consensual sex seed? I don't um, know. Okay. Okay. But you know, rapeseeds, are not, it's illegal to sell rapeseed oil in the United States. It's also an illegal okay. to sell mustard seed oil because they have a monounsaturated fat called erucic acid in them, mm. right? And so this is the problem that in order to make canola oil, which is an acronym for Canadian oil low acid, there's no such mm. thing as a canola plant. Mm. Canada said, hey, we've got these rapeseeds. Let's figure out a way to do this. They genetically modified a rapeseed plant to be low erucic acid, but it still has significant amounts of erucic acid, mm. a fat that has been associated with heart lesions in the studies. And so this is concerning. You're eating two to 3% erucic acid, I believe is the number in canola oil. Native rapeseed plants have 30 to 40%, but you're still getting some. We talked a lot in the last podcast that we just did about cumulative stress. Yes. And so do you really want to be eating this oil? Do you really want to be eating excess amounts of linoleic acid from any seed oil, but canola specifically, 
no, I don't think any human has ever really gone up to a rapeseed plant and said, yum, let me eat this. Like it's right. never, it's never even been a food for humans. And now it's probably the single most consumed seed oil around. It's mm -hmm. touted as healthy by the American Heart Association because it lowers your cholesterol. Wow. Don't you know? Okay. They don't tell you that it oxidizes. That it <laughs> yeah, it's the oxidized cholesterol. Yeah. So um, let's get, let's get, sort of take a, a, a little wander down the, the road of cholesterol because um, I certainly don't have the body of knowledge on cholesterol that you do. But anecdotally, um, as I mentioned, you know, we didn't see a single centenarian that, that did not have what we That's would consider so clinically elevated levels of LDL That's cholesterol. Wild. So LDL cholesterol over 99 nanograms per deciliter. And I think a lot of people don't understand that cholesterol is actually not a fuel source, right? It's a, it's a construction material, one of the main mm -hmm. construction materials in our body. We build hormones, we build cell walls, cell membranes, we make vitamin D3, we make cholecalciferol from cholesterol. And so it's, it's a very necessary compound and yet it is vilified because in my opinion, it's at the scene of the crime, um, but not the one pulling the trigger. And so talk a little bit about cholesterol and maybe some of the challenges and misconceptions in the medical community surrounding cholesterol. Yeah, I think cholesterol is, is really the crux of so many conversations because when humans eat more saturated fat from animals, whether it's butter, tallow, ghee, a steak, and they eat less seed oils, there is a physiologic thing that happens that the ApoB, which is just part of, it's just, just a metric that sort of reflects LDL cholesterol in a little more sophisticated way. LDL slash ApoB containing lipoproteins go up. Mm. And this triggers all sorts of alarm bells in medical offices across the country. And mm. the knee-jerk reaction is, here's a statin. So let's just consider this position. Like when humans eat a diet that is evolutionarily consistent, that essentially mirrors what humans have been doing for hundreds of thousands of years, mm -hmm. And, and they get rid of seed oils and LDL cholesterol goes up a little bit, that's bad. Mm. Because, you know, the position of Western medicine is called the response to retention hypothesis and is essentially that there is a direct geometric relationship between the amount of ApoB containing lipoproteins in your blood and the rate at which you accumulate atherosclerosis in your veins. The more ApoB containing lipoproteins in your blood, the more you get plaque in your arteries. Except when that's not true. <laughs> and, <laughs> except and, when that's not true. Except for, except for the many instances when that relationship does not exist. Mm. And there are so many of these relationships out there that Western medicine ignores wildly. But here's the problem. That if you look at our population as a whole, as Westernized Americans in general, there are multiple studies suggesting that 88 to 93% of us are metabolically unwell. Some mm. form of insulin resistance, right? Mm -hmm. Prediabetes. And that's a big number. And that's 93 to 88% have at least one metric of metabolic syndrome. And I would say that means you have some cascade beginning in your body of insulin resistance, AKA metabolic dysfunction. Right. Even the American Heart Association admits that half of Americans are either pre-diabetic, undiagnosed diabetes, or diabetes. Over 150 million people, according to the American Heart Association, have some form of insulin resistance metabolic dysfunction. Wow. I would argue it's closer to 90%, but even the AHA claims it's over 150 million of 330 million Amer plus Americans. And so when we have a position, when we have a context of metabolic dysfunction, yes, there mm. is a direct geometric relationship between ApoB and atherosclerosis progression. But what if we don't have metabolic dysfunction? Mm. The relationship completely changes. It, it essentially goes to almost zero. There's still a very, very small relationship, but we also know that no study is perfect. There are other things in our environment that can damage the endothelium. Mm -hmm. But I think that if you, if you argue, as Western medicine does, that ApoB is causal, right? Because right. if you have more ApoB and it's not causal, what's the big deal? But it has to be causal. It has to directly injure the endothelium on the inside of blood vessels. If you argue that ApoB is causal in atherosclerosis, then why in someone that's metabolically healthy does it really not have much of a relationship between atherosclerosis or even a very small relationship between mm -hmm. atherosclerosis? And why in someone that's diabetic is the relationship very clear and extremely intense? Like the geometric relationship is much more, mm. uh, a much higher slope. So there's a discordance here in the actual philosophy around ApoB. If ApoB is truly damaging the endothelium, why is it that you have centenarians in your mortality data mm -hmm. that all have high levels of ApoB? Yeah. And they're not dying of atherosclerosis. What's going on? These examples are myriad of discordances, places where ApoB levels don't seem to correlate to the progression of atherosclerosis. Right. And it's generally in people, men and women, who are insulin sensitive. 
So mm. how can you say that ApoB is injuring the endothelium when there's clearly something else going on? And there's other, all sorts of other arguments. In native human biology, we don't get atherosclerosis in veins. We only get it in arteries. Mm -hmm. So you have the same amount of ApoB. It's a continuous system in your vein as you do in an artery. Mm -hmm. But an artery is a higher pressure system with a much higher propensity to have damage to the endothelium, denuding to the endothelium. Right. So if, if you look at the literature in medicine, and my God, I want to debate Peter Atiyah about this. You do? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. and, and everyone else that, that you know, is claiming that ApoB is, is the boogeyman and, and right. that ApoB is causal. If you look at the literature, it's just, it's, it's, there are so many discordances here. And it's just so clear that if ApoB is causing the problem, why are there so many, uh, why are there so many instances where it doesn't look like it's happening? And then it's clear the endothelium must be damaged for atherosclerosis to start. So what damages the endothelium? Oxidation. Well, oxidation, poor repair from an insulin resistance, heavy metals, toxins in our environments, right? So if you have damage to the endothelium, yes, ApoB is involved. Mm. But this is necessary but not sufficient. Mm. So if you have a component that's involved and you have a system where there is constant damage to the endothelium, like diabetes mm. or metabolic dysfunction, is it possible that ApoB looks like more ApoB is bad, but it's not actually beginning the process, right? Mm -hmm. And then interestingly, or connected with that, what about someone that doesn't have rampant endothelial dysfunction happening? What about someone that doesn't have rampant endothelial damage? We all have a little bit, but I think in those of us that are metabolically healthy, we can repair it. We all have high pressure with bifurcations in our arteries. We're all gonna get some denuding of the endothelium of our arterial right. walls, but I believe that we can repair it. Mm -hmm. And so, this is the problem. It's, it's just basically saying something else initiates. ApoB as a causal factor, I completely disagree with that verbiage. I think it's wrong. And I think that it's propagating a, a, a false narrative in medicine. It's incorrect philosophically mm. to say that. And the problem then, like I said, is that people are scared of eating foods that are good for them. Yeah. And they're scared of eating foods. And connected with that, the American Heart Association, the American College of, Cardio College of Cardiology will recommend canola oil to you because it lowers your ApoB. And they will tell you to limit saturated fat because it raises your ApoB when we also know that there are so many populations of free living humans with huge amounts of saturated fat in their diet mm -hmm. and high cholesterol, quote unquote, that don't have any incidence of atherosclerosis in their diets. Mm. It's just they're not eating processed foods. Yeah. And the piece that always gets left out, I know I've been ranting and it's complicated. No, I love this. Um, the piece that always gets left out, and we hinted at this earlier, is that as polyunsaturated fatty acids in seed oils lower your LDL, lower your ApoB, they're also increasing oxidized LDL and LP little a, which are much stronger risk mm. factors for cardiovascular disease. But why is that never addressed? That there's this huge discordance here. So now your, your ApoB goes down and these other ones rise. There's greater degrees of endothelial damage and oxidation. And that, and, and that, that initiates and, the process. And then it initiates the process, even though you've controlled for your ApoB. ApoB, ApoB. Yeah. And we have randomized controlled trials that show this. I mean, the data regarding seed oils and this is hopefully a debate with Lane mm -hmm. that's gonna happen on seed oils at some point. The awesome. The data on the randomized controlled trials on seed oils are, are interesting, they're complicated. There's about 10 randomized controlled trials that have been done in the last 60 to 70 years where researchers have replaced saturated fat in the human diet with seed oils. The problem is that in seven of them, the control arm that was high saturated fat was given a lot of trans fat because it wasn't until the last 20 to 30 years that we realized that trans fat was bad for humans. Mm. So when, people in the health space who are saying that the research says seed oils are benign are quoting studies or meta-analyses. They're basing the meta-analyses. The meta-analyses include trials or are they're quoting studies that are fundamentally flawed mm. where the control group is eating trans fats. But there are three trials where that doesn't seem to have been a major case. And these are Minnesota coronary study, perhaps the best study that's been done on seed oils versus saturated mm. fat, Sydney diet, heart, and rose corn oil study. And these were all seed oils versus saturated fat. Essentially, okay. yeah. And they all found that seed oils were worse. Minnesota coronary was, we talked about this in the last podcast we mm. did, suppressed. Yeah. Right? It took years for that trial to be published. Ansel Keys, the guy that initiated the whole saturated fat fearing, uh, you know, right. uh, uh, sort of... Uh, Cascade with his seven country study was one of the authors. He was one of the researchers on Minnesota coronary, but didn't want to be associated because the results were not what he wanted to see. Right. The results were buried for decades. And what they show us pretty clearly is that when you satur substitute saturated fat from animals with seed oils, you have higher rates of cardiovascular disease and increased rates of death. Wow. Big surprise. 
You're wow. putting more fats into your membranes that are fragile. They're breaking down more. And the problem with seed oils is that they contain this fat linoleic acid, right? Mm -hmm. Which accumulates in our bodies. So we talked about cumulative toxicity in our podcast about fluoride, mm -hmm. uh, about cyanocobalamin, yeah. even folic acid being unmetabolized. Yeah. But I think that this is the problem with linoleic acid, that this is a compound that we never would have been exposed to in these amounts, historically, evolutionarily as humans. But it's in nuts and... In small yeah. amounts. Yeah, it's very small amounts. Have yeah. you seen how many... So Americans eat an average of five to six tablespoons of seed oils per day. Mm. You would have to get over two and a half pounds of sunflower seeds to get that much linoleic acid. Okay. 65 to 75 ears of corn. Okay. <laughs> right? <laughs> like the numbers are staggering. How, yeah. Over two pounds of soybeans. You right. know, like I think it's two and a half to three pounds of soybeans to get the equivalent of that. It's just, we would never have gotten this amount of linoleic acid in our diet. Mm. It's in nuts in small amounts and you eat a small amount of nuts, right? right. How many nuts are in the human diet historically? Small amounts. Like you have to crack every single nut. Right. It's very hard. And you think about, we probably ate some nuts and seeds. I would argue we did that when we were starving as like a fallback food, but then you see it concentrated in the seed oil. You can eat massive amounts. Mm. And if you look at a bag of Lay's potato chips, there's probably, I think, what did we calculate? Like 15 to 17 tablespoons of seed oils in that whole bag. Wow. And you would never have gotten that historically. And whether it's fried in canola oil, we didn't even eat rape seeds. Right, right. Right? So this is an evolutionarily inconsistent amount of a compound, linoleic acid, that then gets stuck in our bodies. Cumulative toxicity. We know that. Cumulative toxicity. Cumulative toxicity. Yeah. And the trick here, if you look at the research carefully, is that the linoleic acid in your fat cells that is reflective of your consumption. It's not in the plasma because plasma gets turned over and this is the other confusing part when people are looking at seed oil consumption. Mm -hmm. But if you look at linoleic acid in fat cells, the more linoleic acid in your fat cells, the higher your rate of cardiovascular disease. Mm. And that is never discussed because people always look at blood. And the problem with blood is that linoleic acid is metabolized by two enzymes, delta-60 saturase, delta-5 desaturase, mm -hmm. into pro-inflammatory mediators. And the people that have the lowest amount of linoleic acid in their blood do the best or excuse me, the people have the lowest amount of linoleic acid in their blood do the worst because they're pushing it all to inflammatory pathways. And so they'll right. look at the literature and say, hey, look, people that have more linoleic acid do better in their blood. People that have less do worse. Therefore, more linoleic acid is better. But what they're really showing is that you don't want linoleic acid to go down that inflammatory pathway and make mm. arachidonic acid or the other downstream mediators, which are highly inflammatory for humans. So, so for somebody that's listening to this podcast, um, you know, how do they go on a journey to avoid high amounts of linoleic acid? Like, where do you find it? How do I avoid it? Obviously, meats and organ meats, but, um, you know, because uh, what if I'm eating vegetables, nuts, fish, chicken, uh, avocados? Small amounts and all that, okay. right? Tallow, 1% to 2% linoleic acid in tallow, 1% to 2% in butter. Nuts can have 15 to 25%, but you're not eating six pounds of nuts. Right, right. Right, if you tolerate nuts, mm -hmm. right? I talked earlier, I think a lot of people do better without nuts in terms of their digestion, but if you tolerate right. nuts, small amounts, right? Mm -hmm. You're not eating five pounds of nuts. Right, right. right? It's concentrated in seed oils. And, it, and the seed oils are corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, grapeseed, peanut. Mm. This is why I'm not a fan of peanut butter. Yeah, right. I'm not a fan of peanut butter so either. So peanut butter is made so from- the worst mycotoxin poison it's, it's made from seen. It's made from moldy, moldy peanuts, yeah. and you're basically making a seed oil. It's not mm. an industrially processed seed oil, but what do you think is on the top of peanut butter that's natural peanut butter? Non-natural peanut butter, the jippy that I used to eat when I was a kid, right? <laughs> they put things in it to prevent the separation of the oil. If you get the natural peanut butter, which I thought was better, mm -hmm. you have the seed oil on top, and that's 30% that's linoleic acid. This is the problem with almond Ooh, butter too. Wow. You're making a seed oil, and that right. seed oil is becoming rancid, it's on top, it's highly oxidized, and you're concentrating linoleic acid. Mm -hmm. You're gonna have a much harder time, unless you're spooning that seed oil into your mouth, mm -hmm. you're gonna mix it back up in the peanut, oil, peanut, peanut butter or the almond butter. You're gonna get less, but it's highly ra rancid and oxidized when you do that. So wow. this is the problem with nut butters. You're not meant to do this. You're not meant to grind up nuts and leave them for months on a shelf. They just, they're fragile. This is right. the problem with, so another one we should talk about is flaxseed oil. Yeah. Highly oxidized. Yeah. Highly oxidized. That's a seed oil. And that's considered like the panacea of healthy oils. It's healthy, bro. Yeah. I mean, I, I literally know people, I happen to agree with you, but I literally know people that actually start their day off with uh, half a tablespoon to a full tablespoon of flaxseed. Oh yeah. And people like, will, oof. this is another thing important to consider. People will also start their day off with a spoonful of fish oil. If you're going to do fish oil, you better know that brand is really good and you don't want to do fish oil in a spoon because that is so highly oxidized when it's exposed to the air. Mm -hmm. So you can't spoon fish oil, horrible mm -hmm. idea. And any of these oils, they just break down over time. Mm -hmm. 
So you just got to be really careful. So avoid the seed oils. That's a that's the first step. And then if you want to get really granular and decrease the amount of linoleic acid in your diet, you want to do grass-fed beef versus grain-fed beef. Ruminants convert polyunsaturated fats to monounsaturated fats. So mm -hmm. ruminants can saturate. We can't do this as humans, but it's really the monogastric animals where the polyunsaturated fats accumulate. Pigs, the eggs of chickens, um, uh, chicken meat, this kind of stuff. So fatty mm -hmm. chicken, eggs, or fatty pork that's fed corn and soy is going to have more linoleic acid in the fat than it would if it were a naturally wild chicken or wild hog. Yeah. So again, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, mm -hmm. but understand that if you're really trying to get this dialed in, I think that a, a, an important metric for humans would be how much linoleic acid is, is in your diet. And wow. one of the things I would love for you guys to do a 10 X, I don't know if you could ever do this is actually sample the amount of linoleic acid in adipose tissue. Mm. And you could track that. What if we could do it in adipose tissue? We could, do, we could do it in the blood. Blood isn't good yeah. because we talked about that. Yeah. You'd have to, you'd yeah. have to, you'd, you'd have, have to just do a, uh, an adipose little biopsy, mm -hmm. just uh, a little, yeah. just pull some adipose tissue mm -hmm. out. You can do it in red blood cell membranes, but it's not great either. The mm -hmm. fat is really predictive. Like I said, the more linoleic acid you eat, mm -hmm. the more that ends up in your fat tissue, the more that's in your fat tissue, the higher rate of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. So what are we arguing about? You right. Know? Well, we're arguing about poorly done studies and confusion over blood levels of linoleic acid because people don't understand how linoleic acid is metabolized. Right. And again, let's just back up, you know, 15,000 years. We would never have had this move, you know, back up a hundred years, seed oils are machine lubricant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cr That's all they're Crisco, good. Yeah. I, I, that, it was like a submarine lubricant. Um, and let me just mention this. I know. And then we'll, we'll stop with seed oils, but 120 years ago, 130 years ago, all Americans ate were animal fats and the rates of cardiovascular disease were a fraction of what they are today. Yeah. So anyone who wants to argue that ApoB going up or animal fats are the cause of cardiovascular disease, you got a really hard argument to make because there's a there's a natural experiment of uh, uh, many millions of Americans from 1900 or 1875 showing mm -hmm. very low rates of cardiovascular disease. All we ate was very very low animal yeah. fat. All we ate, and then something happened in 1950 with Ansel Keys, the Seven Country Study. Eisenhower had his heart attack. His cardiologist was Paul Dudley White, and the American Heart Association got a 1.7 million dollar donation, the equivalent to 20 million dollars today from Procter and Gamble, who made Crisco. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And this is, and then the American Heart Association begins talking about how saturated fats are bad, mm -hmm. polyunsaturated fats are good, and there are literally advertisements from the 1960s talking about how you should polyunsaturate your family. <laughs> is that <laughs> yes, really? Yes, mazola corn oil. And, and that's when we, we got margarine and, uh -huh. and we got all of these like industrial processed oil. Yeah. I, forget, I forget the name of the housewife they had in the ad. It's tonight. Maggie polyunsaturated her whole family with Mazzola corn oil. You can find them. <laughs> oh wow! And you know we can look at. And there's still there's still a you know some people that are of that conventional wisdom that fat makes you fat. I mean I I have female right. clients that won't even wouldn't touch a ribeye, wouldn't eat an avocado, would never touch a raw nut, um, or coconut oil, or olive oil, or or grass fed butter, or ghee, or tallow, because they believe that fat makes you fat. Um, and they're, and they're very heavy. Um, right. We know sugar makes you fat, but. Well, sugar fat. probably sh short circuits our satiety mechanisms. Sugar probably leads to overgrowth of bacteria in the gut, which leads to lipid polysaccharide well, in the body. I think insulin resistance too is all, you know, core component to obesity. It's a huge component of obesity. And I think if you look at it, insulin resistance is probably coming from long-term overconsumption of linoleic acid mm. at a cellular level. And it's, it's chronic toxicity. Right? Because yeah. in the short term, if you look in the short term, seed oils don't create insulin resistance. They mm -hmm. sometimes even make you more insulin sensitive. Mm -hmm. But I think it's so hard to do a long term study on seed oils and insulin sensitivity. But if you look at the mitochondria of people who have insulin resistance, they're not doing oxidative phosphorylation, they're not doing oxidative glycolysis well, they're not moving nutrients through the cellular energy pathways. Mm -hmm. And this can all be connected with changes to the mitochondrial membrane, disruption of the electron transport chain, leakiness of the proton gradients across the inner and mitochondrial matrix spaces. So there's a lot of really interesting hypotheses. It's impossible to do randomized controlled trials about right. this, or they've already been done like Minnesota coronary <laughs> trial. But the mechanistic ideas here are really interesting that accumulation of linoleic acid and probably other polyunsaturated fats in your membranes leads to breakdown of our energy systems. And this is where insulin resistance begins. It's mm. one of the pathways. What, what, what do you really see as some of the challenges in the medical community? And why, 
would it not be adopted as more mainstream? I mean, clearly you make an amazing argument. I actually agree with your argument. Um, but I, I mean, how is it that physicians today, conventionally educated physicians today are not um, ascribing to dietary changes, lifestyle changes as major impacts on, on chronic disease? I mean, I think if your eyes are open, you're, you're, you're looking at this, and we also talked about this on the podcast too, and you're like, look at the spending, look at the rise in chronic disease, look at the mortality rates. Mortality, by the way, in the United States for the first time in 110 years is going backwards. Um, and I was a mortality expert for decades. So I think between the tw 2018 variable basic table and the 2022 variable basic table, the first time we're actually seeing life expectancy go backwards, mm -hmm. which doesn't make sense given the amount of technological advances and and, and science right. and all the things we have to do to right. keep people alive. Um, but what is it about the adoption? You know, one of my opinions is if we don't fix the food supply, we will never fix chronic disease. 100%. And, and you know, but what, what is your opinion on that? I mean, what is, what, what is keeping the medical community from? Yeah, really, there's a maxim that I heard. Um, will you look who this is? Um, because I want to get the name out there so people can find this maxim. It's that the amount of effort required to undo bullshit is 10 times required. It's 10 times greater than the amount of effort required to create it. <laughs> right? Do you hear that? The amount of effort required to undo bullshit is 10 times greater than the amount of effort required to create it. Wow. What we learn first as humans stays in our brain, right? It's hard to undo what your mom told you about broccoli, mm. right? Yeah. Even if, even yeah. if you get a lot of Gosh, gut that's pain, so true. even if you get a lot of gut pain, Right. And I'm not saying your mom is bullshit. And I use the bullshit term all the time. And people say I'm bullshit. So whatever. It's all fair game. Right. Yeah. All is fair in love and war. Um, but it, you know, the problem is that what's the name of the guy? Brandolini's law. Yeah. Brandolini's law. Brandolini's law. Good old. Does it Brand actually say bullshit? It, no, I think it does. <laughs> yeah, I think it does. <laughs> does it actually say bullshit in there? Yes. It does. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Did he do a randomized clinical trial? That <laughs> I mean, was just, <laughs> yeah. This is, this is a meta analysis showing yeah. that it's 10.2 times harder. <laughs> right. But the idea is this, you come into medical school as a bright eyed, intelligent, enthusiastic medical student, and you are taught things. Mm hmm. And it is 10 times harder to undo all that teaching that medical students have all now been indoctrinated, propagandized. We're told in medical school on the first day, half of what you learn is wrong. Mm. Half of what you learn is wrong. And when a doctor speaks out about it, you get pilloried, right? You're told half of what you learn is wrong. And then when a doctor says, I'm questioning the medical system, the medical system will absolutely try and destroy you, discredit you, you're a charlatan, you're a quack, whatever. Right. It's the same thing. So half of what we learn in medical school is wrong. The trick is just which half? Right. And it's really hard for us to change our mind as humans. And a lot of physicians, humans are also tribal. Mm. We look at other physicians and we say, this is what we believe. We believe that statins are good for cardiovascular disease. I believe statins have a place. I don't think they're, I think they're overprescribed and mm -hmm. underappreciated in terms of their side effects. But we believe that statins are good. We believe that saturated fat is causing heart disease. We believe that red meat is bad for you. We believe that, um, you know, your lower your rate will be the better. This is what we believe. This is our mm -hmm. tribe. And we sing and we sing and chant over a fire sponsored by Pfizer, yeah. you know, <laughs> about, about, about how good we are as physicians. And like I said earlier, I believe almost all physicians are intelligent and well-intentioned. We're just fucking brainwashed. Mm. And it's really hard to unbrainwash people, man. It's yeah, really yeah, hard. yeah. No, it, 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 it really is. 10.2 times harder to unbrainwash someone. Yeah. So, so then what are the, what are the basics? I mean, somebody, because, you know, again, my, I, I really have tried to steer my audience to the masses, right? I mean, we talked about this earlier where, you know, instead of ultra woke biohackers talking to ultra woke biohackers, and I know you don't like that term, but I'm going to use it. And, you know, bringing a message down to the masses that here's what you, here's what you've learned that's wrong. It's wrong. You know, I've, I've actually started doing this thing I call lateral shifts where I take, I go into anybody's cabinet and I, I take whatever it yeah. is that they like to eat. And I say, okay, I'm not going to add a dime to your budget. I'm going to not change the flavor profile. I'm just going to massively shift the nutritional profile and show you how you can go from like this Dan and yogurt with fruit on the bottom and high fructose corn syrup to, um, you know, a whole fat Greek yogurt with a fistful of berries and some natural honey and still you'll actually be more satiated, satiated, have a better nutritional profile, and you actually won't miss the taste right. of that. Um, and so, you know, talk a little bit about the starting point um, for someone, because it seems, it seems extreme for me to go, do I have to go just all meat all the time right out of the gate? Or like, what are some of these steps I can take, you know, to, to, to get going? I think I love the idea of lateral shifts. I think it's just the idea of better than. Yeah. Wherever you Same. are now. 
do better than tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, you said something earlier, progression versus perfection. Don't let perfect be the enemy per, of good. Per, per, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. 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 So in other words, don't not don't do nothing because you can't be perfect. Exactly. Right. And and I and I take the opposite coin and side of the coin that, you know, a lot of what you espouse, what I espouse, is not fear mongering. It's actually clearing the air. Knowledge is power. Right? Yeah, it's knowledge is power, but it's also making things easier. Do you know how easy it is to eat like that? I mean, you know, it's how much easier it is to navigate a restaurant, um, how much easier it is to navigate a grocery store, how much easier it is to navigate, you know, food choices when you're you, when you're not in your own home and cooking your own food. If, if you know that whole grass-fed meats, organ meats, um, you know, berries, honey, you know, that, that, there are really nutritious food choices that you can make pretty much available anywhere. Um, and you don't have to be like hyper attentive to exhaustively reading every label. Yeah, it's, yeah, so. it's understanding that it's just do better than what you're doing now. And like mm -hmm. you said, there's a shift between, I think first step, the smallest amount of ultra processed foods you can eat, yeah. right? Less things that have had all the information that we would have always associated with them historically, evolutionarily stripped away. Less chips, less seed oils, less yeah. of that stuff. And just eat whole plant foods and whole animal foods. What, what, um, and hopefully some organs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, you know, I, I haven't gotten there on the organs. You know, you know I get, I get my grass fed meats from this place called Parker Pastures in, in um, Colorado. And, and I love them because they're, they're, they're family farm and they, they don't vaccinate their cattle. It's all grass fed, grass finished. But um, she does these organ blends where she takes the, awesome. the grass fed, the, 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 the hamburger meat and, and mixes it with organ meats. And it's delicious. Right. Straight to the organ meats is still like the, the liver is still, still a little tough for me. It's probably <laughs> always going to be that way. I mean, when I first started eating liver, I was in medical school and I would literally gag. Yeah. I, I would just, I would gag. I remember it's just, such <laughs> an acquired taste, man. It's, it's, if you give it to a child when they're eight months or a mm -hmm. year old and they haven't had years and years mm -hmm. of cocoa pebbles and these other flavors, <laughs> they're going to be fine with it. Yeah. Kids love this stuff. Yeah. But my niece and nephew are four and six. You know, mm -hmm. my mom is 73. My dad is 73. And so I realized, I mean, I want people to eat fresh organs, but mm -hmm. this, this, this like gap here was why mm -hmm. I built my first company. So Hardened right. Soil makes the desiccated organ supplements. I brought you some with testicle, by the way. Let's fire it up. Uh, yeah, uh, not, oh, actually, I'm not going to eat a testicle on my podcast. It's, is it's it a capsule test testicle. Oh, capsule testicle. Okay. You can take it with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I've seen people on Instagram like, the, in the, I'm like, I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> no, I'll give it to you after the podcast. I got, Listen, a, I I wanna, got a bottle of like I don't, I don't testicle capsules. <laughs> But what's oh. so interesting is that, you know, my- you have my, some sticks too that I want I do to have some sticks. I'm going to get you this too. Okay, yeah, I yeah. Try, I try um, but the, you know, my, my um, here, I'll give you this. Let me, yeah, yeah, let me fire that up. Right my, there. my sister, so my niece and nephew are four and six and they won't eat liver, but you can take the capsule and empty it into their smoothie and they never know. Right. Right. How cool is that? Perfect. My mom takes the, the beef organ supplement from Hard and Soil mm -hmm. all the time. And this is another thing that I'm super proud of. So you got to try one of these beef, okay. beef sticks. So I'm I just, this is the second company that I've built. And it's really humbling to build these companies because mm -hmm. it's just really cool to think about doing things in the world that help make people's lives better. Yep. I really only, I want people to eat whole foods and I want people to eat fresh foods. So do I. And so I want to make the highest quality stuff. And this is what come, this is sort of the, the agency that comes with the, the work that I've done in the world is I can build this. I could never have built this, you know, a few years ago, but how cool is yeah. this to be able to build this? So this is a grass fed, grass finished meat stick, the first of its kind in the world. Really? Yeah, with organs in it. So this contains oh. liver and heart in the beef stick. Okay. I went to Australia to see the farms that we source from. These are the most beautiful farms I've ever seen in my whole life. Really, in Australia? They're green pastures right on the ocean. It's like literally million dollar real estate and it's cows grazing on grass. Oh, dude, that's freaking awesome. You guys want to try? Yeah. Give it to these guys. Please. I'm not kidding. Like, I'm not just saying that because you're on the podcast. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm like, I'm not going to sit here with Paul Saldino and be like, that's awful. No, it's freaking good. <laughs> it's grass-fed beef, grass-fed liver, grass-fed heart, vinegar, See, I think I think this salt, mix and is so much tasting. better because the, the liver has, a, I call it a gamey taste or whatever. Yeah. Pretty intense. What do you think? Isn't that good? Yeah. <laughs> and it's important because a lot of a lot of women fear this stuff too. And mm -hmm. like most of us have a very difficult time meeting our protein needs, and certain protein sources like whey protein and others can be as little as 20% absorbable. This is 99% absorbable and it has all of the essential amino acids that the body needs to build lean muscle, to recover, to improve our exercise performance, and most importantly, to repair 
after we have intense exercise. So this is called Perfect Amino by Body Health. It's like I said, 99% absorbable. It only has two calories. Eventually the caloric intake has virtually no caloric intake. It will not break a fast. It tastes amazing. You mix it in water. I take this literally every single morning. If you're working out in a fasted state, you have to take a full spectrum amino acid prior to your workout to preserve your lean muscle and make sure that you're recovering properly. And again, it will not break your fast. So the caloric impact is virtually zero. You get all of the full spectrum amino acids. It tastes wonderful. I use it every single day. You can go to bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. That's bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate and look for the perfect aminos. They actually come in capsules if you're on the go or it becomes in several flavors that they make in a powder, which I love. It's flavored with natural um, uh, means of flavoring. So there's no artificial sweeteners in here. So this is one of my absolute favorite products. Give it a try. If you're working out at all, you need a full spectrum amino acid. Go to bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. That's bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. I love their lab tested products. You can actually see the absorption rate for all of their products. They've got great electrolyte protein combinations. My favorite is the perfect aminos. Bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. And now back to the Ultimate Human Podcast. There's like a voice off camera right now. <laughs> this is different than Chomps. So this is air dried. I, don't, I will talk about this just for a second, but Chomps, I, we don't have to name their brands. They're cooked, right? They're cooked. And when they cook something, they have to put lactic acid and sodium nitrate or sodium nitrate or celery powder, which is just a stand in for the same things in it. <laughs> These are five days air dried at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. They never get heated above 78. They're in a, they're in a cooler for five days getting air dried. How do you find these people? I built this. Oh. oh. <laughs> I built this. You found the farm and then you built the process. Yes. Wow. Yes. Can I invest? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I think you probably can. Be, oh, no. It's, it's, it's actually awful. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so cool to, to build things like this. And we were talking off camera before the podcast. Like doing what we do is a blessing and a curse because it means that I can't make bullshit products because my fans will keep me honest, right? Right. Like Hard and Soil will never make something in a plastic bottle. You know, mm. we'll never use garbage ingredients. We'll never use garbage ingredients in this. I never mm. wanted to put celery powder or lactic acid in these. And the way Amen. that it comes out when it's air dried is so much better than when it's cooked. Now, having said that, better than can also be a grass-fed beef stick in a grocery store that's cooked. That mm -hmm. can be way better than right. a Slim Jim, right? Right. But what's exciting for me is to give people opportunities to, to have something that's like the quality that I really want, that I'm proud of giving to my sister that's and my so family awesome. and my niece and nephew. And my, my niece and nephew go crazy for beef sticks. They like, do? Yeah, like young kids, oh, all so they do awesome. is snack. I didn't know this. Yeah. I don't have kids, but like all these, they eat all the time. So it's cool to create things in the world that make people's lives easier. I agree. And also have this message behind them. And it's been, a, it's been an incredible journey. Because I've, 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 I've been on a journey to, to, to build a chemical-free living brand. And, you know, eventually- It's got to be hard. Humans. It's very right? hard for cleaning products, for toothpaste, for dishwasher detergents, and, you know, soaps and all kinds of things. Because, I, I, again, you know, back to just micro-poisoning ourselves. Yeah. To death, the cum cumulative dose toxicity. So, so we're- is Paul Saladino the the evolving carnivore MD? Where where is all of this headed? It's a, headed to um, you know products like these that are to to help feed the masses. I have actually happen to agree that if we don't fix the food supply, we'll never fix chronic disease. Yeah, um, is that where your passion projects are now? No, these are from surfing. They, yeah, <laughs> surfing is a huge passion of mine. These are just side projects. I think that I feel most compelled to like. I mean, this will sound cheesy, just fight the good fight. You mm -hmm. know, there's a, and I don't know that it's necessarily a fight. It's just, there's a lot of discordant voices in the health space mm -hmm. and it's confusing for people. And I think that a lot of these people are well-intentioned and smart. Mm -hmm. I just think it's important to try and have respectful discussions on different I views. Respectful is the main thing. Yeah, respectful yeah. discussions on differing views. And I want to try and create ideas and content for people that helps them navigate. Because I imagine people are listening to this going, this is different than what I've heard, right. right? They've heard somebody else on a podcast say, "Worry, don't worry about, or like you're, you should be concerned be about- Be raw food vegan. Yeah, be a raw food vegan, or be worried about blood glucose spikes, or honey is horrible, or fruit is horrible, or vegetables are great for you. And I don't think vegetables are horrible, but like I said, there's a time and a place, and maybe some people are different than others. And so I, I think that mostly what I'm excited about now is just trying to create content in the, in the most, um, in the most, you know, sovereign and the most 
consistent way that I feel good about, you know, mm-hmm. in my heart, that's like putting ideas in the world that help people navigate this confusing landscape. Yeah. You know, in the most truthful way to myself, like, because I just think that I'm a doctor, you know, I spent decades doing this. I have a doctoral degree and it's still confusing for me. It's took right. me, it takes time yeah. to read 10 different randomized controlled tri- trials on seed oils and realize, hey, they're using trans fat. They're using you know, a hydrogenated fat in the control group. These are not valid studies. Right. How is anyone going to make sense of this stuff? Yeah, no, it's very, very hard. And then you got to look at the, you, you know, the uh, this disclaimers and, and you know, the conflicts of interest section. Sometimes you see that actually the company that's actually putting out a certain drug is actually touting the drug's efficacy. And you go, <laughs> well, I, it's hard for me to really trust that. And you don't see the whole data. You only see the published data. You know, the 20, I think it's 19 of the 20 people on the, USDA guidelines for nutrition in the United States mm-hmm. from 20 to 20 to 20, 2020 to 2025 have conflicts of interest with pharmaceutical companies, food industry, ultra processed food. 95% of people who are on the committee that makes our food guidelines in the United States have conflicts of interest. Wow. 95%. And it's going to be the same for the 2025 to 2030 guidelines. Mm. And the guy who's one of the chairs for the 2025 to 2030 guidelines for food in the United States, which a lot of people listening to this podcast don't care about, but it's what shapes food lunches. It's what mm-hmm. shapes school, school lunches. lunches yeah. yeah. And it's what shapes policy and it's what shapes all sorts of things. The guy who's one of the chairs for that is the same guy who authored the food compass study that told us frosted mini wheats were healthier than beef and eggs. Wow. It's the same guy who wrote a meta-analysis on seed oils saying they're benign and included all of the studies that are confounded by this trans fat in the control group. And it's the same guy who also receives funding from Bungie, a seed oil company. Wow. And, and also, I believe, Ilse, which is one of the major sort of conglomerates of ultra processed food. So this, this guy's name is Darius Mazafarian. He's at Tufts. And I can say that because I'm not afraid of getting sued. Right. Because it's all true, what I just said. Right. It's kind of like, you know, it's not slander if it's true. Right. And it's not a conspiracy theory if you're just following the facts. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's yep. all true. And I mean, I've talked to people who have spoken with him. I've never spoken with him. I'd love for him on my podcast. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go, bro. What's his name? Darius Mazafarian. Dar- Darius Mazafarian. Uh, you're invited to the you're, you're being paid. Paul Saladino podcast. <laughs> And, but it's just, yeah, it's crazy stuff. I've spoken to people who have spoken to him. You know, Callie Means is a friend of mine. He mm-hmm. used to work in the sort of processed food industry. He was a, uh, he was a sort of a, a policymaker or a, an advocate at Coca-Cola. Mm. So he was in the boardrooms of Coca-Cola when they were planning, how do we get in front of this idea and make people think that high fructose corn syrup is fine. Mm. He was part of the enemy. You know, he was like on the, uh, the dark side and he came over to the rebel lions. Mm. Right. But he, you know, when he was talking about these ideas with Darius and, and suggesting publicly that there's perhaps a conflict of interest here, Kelly told me that like, this guy calls him on the phone and says, how can you do this? You know, this is how we make, this is how we fund studies. And he was literally like yelling at him on the phone. Wow. So it's crazy. And I'm not looking to be disrespectful. I'm just saying truth is truth. Yep. And it's it's not slander if it's true. No, no, it's not slander if it's true. <laughs> this, is, this is so awesome, man. I love helping, you know, people like yourself get the message out. Um, I'm going to throw um, links to some of your your products into the show notes. Where can people find you? Most of my audience is probably familiar with you, but for those that are not, where can they find you? Um, How do they find out more about you and and get more guidance from your books and teachings, what have you? Paul Saladino, MD on all the socials. You can find me everywhere. Yeah, I've got a podcast. I'm on all the socials. Great podcast too. That's where you find me. So, um, Paul, I ask every guest the same question at the end of the podcast, and there's no right or wrong answer to this. Um, It's just a thought-provoking question. What does it mean to you to be an ultimate human. I think it's basically living the birthright that we all have to be mm. vital, right? So I think that our our resting state, our the state of lowest entropy, which is thermodynamically whatever, but uh, the state that we should fall back to, the state that we have a birthright to, is a happy, healthy, vital human that can do what they want, that can play with their grandkids or their kids. Like we mm. have this. I love this this word birthright. You know, mm. we have a birthright to be way healthier and way more capable than we are told by society. You go to a Western medical doctor with any ailment, they say it's bad family history. You can't fix it. Most of the time they'll say, here's a pill. But I mm. think that being an ultimate human is just going back to what is ours as our birthright. This, this mm. idea that as humans, we can be incredibly vital and just radical humans at our, at our natural state, at our baseline state, at our resting, you know, just at our resting state, we are mm. incredibly you know, vital humans. And that is when, that's what happens when we align the way that we're living with the way that we've lived for hundreds of thousands of years as humans. I love it. It's not feeling amazing. It's just feeling normal. 
Yeah, and normal is amazing by today's yes, standards. Exactly. Yes. Right? Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming on today. Thanks for having me this on, has brother. been awesome, man. This was one of the easiest conversations I've had in a very amazing. long time, man. So, so much lot, fun. Thank lot you, comment. Appreciate you too, oh, brother. <laughs> Man's handshake. I know. I'm like reaching around the yeah. microphone. That's just science. <laughs>